I want to open up in our Bibles tonight to Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 20. If you're taking notes tonight, remember you're 10 times more likely to go to heaven. The title of tonight's talk, and I want to get out of the way. We're going to be free flowing tonight. Is that okay? Say yes. And so, worship team, don't go far, just stay near. And we're, we're, we're kind of we're gonna we're gonna go together. We're gonna we're gonna act like this is camp. Somebody say glory. glory. And um, and so uh, Ephesians chapter six verses ten through twenty. God's got hands. God's got hands. Ephesians chapter six verses ten through twenty um, is Paul concluding the letter to the church at Ephesus, and he says one final thought. Say one final thought. Paul says one final thought. I am saying this in conclusion to what I've been saying. And he says this, a final word, verses 10 through 20, a final word. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. In whose power? Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so that you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. In addition to all of these, hold up the, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. And pray for me too. Ask God to give me the right words so I can boldly explain God's mysterious plan that the good news is for the Jews and Gentiles alike. I'm in chains now, still preaching this same this message as God's ambassador. So pray that I will keep on speaking boldly for him as I should. Paul's concluding in conclusion what he's been talking about in the whole of the book of Ephesians. Um, and he tells us to put on the armor of God. Now, I'll continue to explain this in greater detail as the talk goes on, but I've always been a little confused by the armor of God. It almost felt like I needed to be proficient in algebra and physics to understand how to put this on and fight back the wiles of the enemy. In fact, spiritual warfare almost seemed as if it was for the spiritually elite and the Jedi Knight Green Beret of Christians. Do you, have you ever gotten that feeling? It was like, we're, I read all kinds of books growing up, Shadow Box. 14 root spirits, five open doors. I'm like, my God, like to be able to be free and do spiritual warfare, it's like you you had to legitimately be a Navy SEAL in the army of the Lord. Say amen. I mean, it was it was intense. And and the reality is, is like sometimes that can just feel exhausting. Have you ever, how many of you love to watch fighting on TV? We all know who needs prayer. I, I'm, I'm, I'm in fact, so last night, like I love boxing. I love wrestling, I love UFC, I love all of it. If there's a pay-per-view fight and it's a big fight, Gabriel is probably not missing it. In fact, it's like the thing to do. Uh, I bought an 84-inch OLED TV to watch fights, say glory. And so when the pay-per-view fight is on, everyone comes to Gabriel's house to be able to watch the fight. Elfin can, can testify to this. And so all the big boxing matches, all the UFC matches are, are watched in my house. And there's, there's a certain individual that I cannot stand watching fights around. And it's that individual, I call him an armchair lazy boy champion. It's that guy that's saying, man, why don't you hit him? Hit him. And the guys are kind of feeling each other out. They're, they're kind of, it's in the first round or whatever have you. And they're, they're kind of dancing around in the ring a little bit, making sure to kind of execute a plan and be able to make sure that the, the game plan that they've trained for for weeks and or months is going to be executed. So they're kind of feeling that out. And the guy that's the lazy boy champion on the armchair, huh, if I was in there, I'd punch that guy square in the face. When I was on the playground when I was three years old, I took down that fifth grader. Like, sure you did, buddy. Okay. Legend in your own mind, right? And I, I can't, and, and it's just like, bro, have you ever been in a fight? Let's just be honest for a second. Have you ever been in a fight? 
Like it's, it's mind boggling to me. I'm like, have you ever been? And well, if I was in there, I'd punch that guy right square in the face. And did you know that fighters are not just going melee after each other because their bodies would actually shut down. Their bodies would build up lactic acid like that. In fact, it's a terminology in boxing called punch drunk. If I were to take you to a heavy bag right now and put a clock on for 60 seconds, 60 seconds, I don't care how good a shape y'all in here, you're on a cross country, it don't matter because this is a different type of muscle group. Just hit the bag as hard as you can for 60 straight seconds just and just go but I'm talking 45 seconds in the the measure in which you're hitting that bag will decrease significantly you'll be hitting as hard as you can at first and then by the end of it, you're just barely tapping that bag and you're like and if you keep going and I keep having you go you'll I'll actually get you to stop and you'll feel lightheaded it's called punch drunk You've actually become punch drunk. You've punched yourself out of being powerful. You've punched yourself out of being uh, conditioned, and now you're fatigued, and you're very vulnerable to your opponent. That is why in professional fighting, as an actual sport, you don't go after each other in melee. And most of us approach spiritual warfare much of the same way. We're punch drunk. You came into this week. You came into tonight. You're exhausted. I mean, in, in my own life, I've tried to heal the wounds of a systemic broken past and to only find out that I cannot do this on my own because it's by grace through faith that I've been saved. And this is not of Gabriel. I can't save myself. Is that good news? Say yes. I've sat there and thought, man, I'm going to overcome anger. And in my teenage years, they sent me to psychologists, psychiatrists, group therapy, and there was no way in healing Gabriel's anger. They tell me, you're just like your dad. It's probably hereditary. And I was a bad case of little man syndrome and a perverted sense of masculinity in a neighborhood that I thought I had to be from. And I just always would act out. I always was in that place. And it wasn't until I came to a place of spiritual warfare that I knew this was not about me fighting harder. It was about me faithing more. And trusting that God had appropriated freedom for me. Listen, spiritual warfare, I, I get it. I'm, I, I always think if I'm not trying hard, I'm not doing it right. I have a propensity because of my type A personality to try to make it happen. And some of us in here, you're trying to fight anxiety. That's an oxymoron. You actually only exasperate it. Some of us are trying to heal ourselves of depression get ourselves rid of unforgiveness and it's all out of might and out of power and we think of spiritual warfare scriptures and let me let me get the sword of the spirit and let me wield this sword and let me let me try to chop at this and try to chop at that and 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 and, and you listen the word of god is powerful but when we're sitting here and we're trying to partner with our salvation and our sanctification it's no longer grace it's your works and we're punch drunk and we're punch drunk and we're trying to go at it with all of our might only to find out by the end we're super exhausted and some of us have walked into a week like this and we're just tired we need a fresh wind we need a fresh fire times of refreshing come from the spirit of the lord do you believe that say yes and sometimes to its most fatal conclusion we can get so tired so tired some of us even question walking away from Jesus and community altogether. It must not work for me. The truth is we weren't allowing him to work for us. Because we're American. And our Western rugged individualism always gets in the way. If it's, up to, if it's meant to be, it's up to me. God only helps those who help themselves. That sounds extremely spiritual. It's just not scriptural. God always helps those who can't help themselves. All the time. I'm gonna pull myself up by my own bootstraps. Do you even wear boots? <laughs> God's got hands. Now, if we're talking about football, that means that he can catch really well. But where I'm from, when I say somebody's got hands, it means he can fight. It means he's really bad to the bone. Yo, Zach, he got hands. If I said that about Pastor Zach, that means that dude can fight. That means if you're in a dark alley in the middle of Manhattan, you want him with you. That means that if he's got hands, that's somebody said no. I believe you can fight, Pastor Zach. Somebody hating on you over there. <laughs> I'm with you. We're, we're, we're going we're gonna to win together or run together, one of the two. And so when I say 
God's got hands. It means that God is really good at fighting. He's really good at accomplishing the task that he was set forth to do. And so Ephesians chapter 6 verses 10 through 20, three things if we're going to put on the armor of God and we're going to enter into this world and allow God to be the one that fights our battles. Number one, you have to know, you have to know that our attacks are coming. They're coming. Ready or not, here we come. Number two, put on the full armor of God. You have to put on the full armor of God. And number three, stand firm and unmoved. When you've done everything, just stand. When you've done everything, just stand. Isn't that interesting? The verb there is literally like passive, just stand. And like, no, no, I gotta do something, right? No, 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 just stand, unmoved. That, well, number one, attacks are coming. Number two, put on the full armor of God. And number three, stand firm and unmoved. First Peter chapter four says, don't think it's strange, these fiery trials that are gonna come upon you. Now, Peter is writing to the dispersed churches around Jerusalem, and when he says, don't think it's strange, these fiery trials that are coming towards you, he's talking about people who were actually being persecuted by the Roman government and were being impaled and then pitched with tar and lit on fire alive. So when he says, don't think it's strange, these fiery trials, he's legitimately talking about martyrdom, people being killed and dying for their faith in Jesus Christ. Talk about fiery trials. The implication to the, to the hearer was much much more uh, uh, exhaustive than what me and you would realize a fiery try says don't think this strange as, as if something were strange were happening to you you know it's it's interesting some people you join the military and you're thinking, man, I came here for a GI Bill. I'm trying to go to college for free or I came here to kind of do this in my life and then war happens and we get into a conflict with another country and now that, that, that thing that you signed up for now is implied with something else. You are a soldier of a government and you now have to take orders and some of us come into the kingdom of God and this is never usually explicitly communicated from a preacher but somehow culturally it's implicit and it says this, when when we come to Jesus, life is going to get better, it's going to be, make more sense, and all of a sudden we're gonna, have, we're, gonna, we're gonna walk through the tulips and the sunshine and rainbows and get caught in the rain drinking pina colada. And then we find out we're in a war. And there's a devil who hates you. Put your hand over your heart and say, he hates me. He hates you. You are in a legitimate war right now, whether you believe it or not. You are in a war. Do you believe that? Say yes. yes. Do you believe that? Say yes. yes. But you'll never, ever be tempted or tried beyond what you are able. You have a disposition written inside of your DNA for everything you will ever come across for victory. Some of you say, man, I couldn't live through your story. I couldn't live through yours. You'll never be tempted beyond what you're able. Does that make sense? Beyond what you're able. And he says, now put on the full armor of God. Put on the full armor of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses three through five says this. Take every thought captive. Well, we don't wage war. Like the world does far, our weapons are not carnal, but they're mighty for the pulling down of strongholds. Here, I'll just read it. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verses three through five. We are human, but we don't wage war as humans do. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and destroy false arguments. Every, in the New King James, the way I memorize it, every thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture their rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. We take every thought, this is in the New King James, we take every thought captive that it may be obedient to Christ Jesus. We put on the full armor of God. We, our weapons are for the renewing of the mind. Our weapons are not these, these weird, eclectic, how do we make sense of this? I've heard elaborate teachings on the, on the armor of God. All of the weapons besides the sword are all defensive. This is your only offensive move, uh, 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 weapon and, and all of these things. And here's the thing is that well, those weapons are, are, are put together because they're indicative of how we're renewing our mind. 
of how we're renewing our mind. You can't fight the same way the world does. We are living addicted, depressed, anxious, with encyclical sin patterns because we're fighting the same way the world does. And in the kingdom, it's counterintuitive. It does not work the same way. We take every thought captive that may be obedient to Christ Jesus. You can implore all of the disciplines you want. You can change your environment, think good thoughts, but the only thing that's going to change, you may have good vibes, but unless you have the almighty power of God and you're applying it to the renewing of your mind that's all you'll ever have but we need more than good vibes we need God's results amen we need more than something that changes our mood we need something that changes us because our moods right I get over anger I'm not anxious I'm feeling this way and 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 this way or that way and God is saying no 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 I want to change you not just your mood, not just your mood. Don't be deceived. You're in a world. I'm not saying every cold is spiritual warfare, but I'm also trying to tell you that not everything is coincidence. I'm not saying your flat tire is spiritual warfare. It may just be you ran over a nail. Hello. But what I'm also saying is not everything is coincidence. We have to, I, I, I sometimes can have this faith and not fully realize that there are other things that are affecting my life. There are powers and principalities in the unseen world that do affect what you and I see in the here and in the now. There is a real devil and a real war and real demons and real angels in a real spiritual realm. We are in a war. I'm again not saying that your cold, that your sore throat is a spiritual warfare, but I'm also saying it may not be coincidence. It may not be coincidence. It may not be a coincidence. And here's, and the third thing is to say, stand firm and unmoved. Stand firm and unmoved. Now, if you take a closer look at the armor, Paul is saying a final thought in the book of Ephesians. If you look at Ephesians, you'll find that the theme over the whole of the book is the body of Christ. Who we are in the body. If you look at Colossians, the theme is who he is as the head of the church, who Christ is as the head. The Ephesians is the body. If you go to chapter one, you'll find that he begins to use the language of predestination and being chosen in Christ, say in Christ. If you go to Ephesians chapter two, you'll find that you were dead in your trespasses, but you've made, been made alive in Christ, say in Christ. And now he saved you by grace through faith, and this is not of yourselves, for you were created in Christ, say in Christ, for good works which he knew beforehand. Then you go down into verse 14 of chapter two, and you see that in Christ, say in Christ, he became our peace, breaking down the wall of hostility that separated Jew and Gentile. Now there's neither male nor female, Jew nor Greek, but one in Christ. And he's became our peace in Christ. Say in Christ. If you go to Ephesians chapter 3, he begins to paint the picture of his power as the body in Christ. Now, I am able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that I could ever ask, think, or imagine to the glory of Christ, his church, in Christ, say in Christ. If you go to Ephesians chapter four, you find in verse 11, kind of the crescendo of that scripture, of, 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 of that text and that chapter, and he says this, I gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, and this was for the equipping of the body in Christ, say in Christ. If you go to Ephesians chapter five, the crescendo of that chapter is now the imagery of marriage and that two becoming one body in Christ. And this mystery I speak of, Paul says it explicitly, this mystery I speak of is Christ and his church becoming one. Now you get to Ephesians chapter six and he says a final word. The final word, and he begins to give these descriptions of these individual uh, uh, pieces of armor. And I just think that he wasn't giving us out this algebraic formula that was trying to teach us how to do spiritual warfare. 
that was ultimately confusing only for the Green Beret Christian Christians, the Navy SEAL intercessors, you know the ones in the church, a couple of them prayed for me this morning, super spiritual. They hear the heart of God on perfect frequency. Those people, you know, you know the old grandma that prayed to you every day at church, and we think they're the only ones who can do spiritual warfare, and he says a final word, and he begins to give these different body parts, and he's talking about a body all the way through the text, and it says this, for he gave, uh, gave us a helmet of salvation, who is your salvation? Jesus. And he gave us the breastplate of righteousness. Who is your righteousness? And he gave us the shield of faith, but in whom do we place our faith? And he gave us the sword of the spirit in which is the word. And who is ultimately the word? John 1, 1, Genesis 1, right? And then he gave us the shoes shot with the gospel of peace. Who became our peace? So when God begins to give a description of spiritual warfare, he's not giving us a pragmatic of principles or things or tactics to employ. He's giving us the imagery of what it looks like to stand in a person, to stand as a body, to stand with victory. This in spiritual warfare doesn't, doesn't come in here where saying, Here's my sword, here's my shield, here's my helmet, I'm ready for battle, I'm ready for war. No, 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 spiritual warfare in the kingdom says, I'm walking up into this joint from victory, not for victory. I'm coming into this place, not trying harder, but trusting more. In the kingdom of God, it doesn't look like I'm trying to war. It looks like I'm worshiping because I stand inside of Almighty God, the victorious one. And we look at stories like David without a crystal-centric lens, and we think that we're David slaying the giant. You're the cowering Israelite, afraid of Goliath. Jesus is David. This is how I fight my battles. My God's got hands. My daddy's bad to the bone. Did you ever argue with people in the sandbox telling them, thinking your daddy was better than their daddy? My daddy beat up your daddy. Here's the reality. My daddy whooped that daddy booty. My daddy will beat up the devil on every day of the week. His name is Jesus. He's the man. He's the champion. He never loses. He's never lost. He's undefeated with knockout power. His name is Jesus. I stand with him. I stand, I stand behind him all bad. I'm like, yo, what, what you want, devil? I'm behind him. I'm in this body. This is my inheritance. Exodus 14, 14 says, this army you see today, you will never see again, for this is the Lord's battle. Everywhere you see the battle in scripture, it is never, uh, it is never applied to you and me. It is the Lord fights this battle. This army you see today, you will never see again, for this is the Lord's battle. As they're standing at the Red Sea with the chariot armies coming right after them. This battle, this army you see today, isn't that interesting? This army you see today, this anxiety you see today, this depression you see today, this sin you you see today this discouragement you see today you will never see again for this is the Lord's battle could it be that we keep seeing the same enemies because we're not giving the Lord the battle and we're trying to fight it ourselves could it be could it be that we haven't let go and let God not to give a little cute colloquialism that preachers like to give and sound tweet worthy but I'm talking about a real letting go and letting God saying I stand in my peace in my mind is that he saved me I stand in the knowledge that he's save me. I stand with the breastplate that you cannot pierce my heart because my perfection was not contingent on the mistake I just made. My perfection is protected by his righteousness and his work for me. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20 verse 15, Jehoshaphat is freaking out. Can I say freaking out in church? Sorry, I didn't mean to say that. He's, he's all trepidatious. And he's, oh my God, all these armies are coming after me. And then he gets this prophetic word. This army you see today? What does he say again? This is the Lord's battle. Let me, let me, do not be discouraged. Do not be afraid by this mighty army. For the battle's not yours, but it's God's. For the battle is not yours, but it's God's. Spiritual warfare. I used to read all these spiritual warfare books. I wanted, I wanted to feel freedom. I wanted my family to have freedom. And I was like, oh my God, I gotta memorize all these 50 prayers and I gotta renounce all these sins and I gotta, and what about my generational curses? 
What about them? 2 Corinthians 5.17 says that if those who are in Christ Jesus, and this text is giving you imagery of who you are in Christ, saved, righteous, full of faith, with the word and peace, the belt of truth, I had to mention the truth, praise God for truth, the belt of truth, who is the way, the truth, and the life? Jesus, the truth. And I was trying to remember, and what about these generational curses? And I have to renounce these. And, renou and if those who are in Christ Jesus are new creations, the old is past. Behold, all things have become new. A new creation. In other words, I got royalty inside my DNA. To quote a, a, a popularized philosopher, for the young people will get it. I got royalty inside my DNA. I got kingship inside my DNA. I have almighty God who's renewed my DNA. I'm no longer attached to a generational curse of addiction and drugs and gangs and brokenness and divorce and poverty. I have a new DNA that says I'm a child of the living God. I've been born into a new family. I'm connected to a new body. This battle is not mine. It's the Lord's. It's the Lord's. I believe generational curses are going to be broken once and for all tonight. Say tonight. Once and for all tonight. And it's not going to be because we prayed more fervently than before, but because we trusted more than we ever have before. Because this is the Lord's battle. We stand in a person we stand with Jesus if you ever hear my preaching you will always see me just keep coming back to Jesus because listen here's the reality he my eyes are fixed on Jesus for who's the author and finisher of my faith but Jesus I can't write a better story he's the author he's the finisher he is the Lord Exodus 15 says this that the Lord is a warrior his name is Yahweh. I love that about Jesus, about our God. You know, he's not a baby in a manger. He's not a blue-eyed, manicured-looking dude that you see on pictures. The dude is bad to the bone, rugged contractor. And when he comes back, he's coming back on a white horse full of blood with angels, with an angel full of uh, an army of angels, a man of war. He's coming back as a man of war. Say, who wants some? Who wants some? You? <laughs> this is the Lord's battle. We're punch drunk. You're tired because we're fighting all wrong. Because we're fighting. And, what, and fighting in the kingdom doesn't look like exude, exuding more energy. It looks like trusting more it looks like trusting more one final thought and he starts to tell us how we're covered because we're in christ one final thought be strong and in the, in the mighty power of the lord be strong be strong i love that he starts off with that a final word be strong in the lord and in his mighty power and in his mighty power you know as I, was, as I was growing up i always got allured into a fight i've never started a fight legitimately i know you're not going to believe me because i'm talking crazy i never actually started a fight most people on a playground when you're the smaller guy they're weak-minded and so they want to pick on who they think is the weakest link well that was a terrible mistake for them because I've been picked on zero times in my life because I will punch you in the face in the name of Jesus. <laughs> and I may not even win every fight, but I just know for sure you're not gonna pick on me. But I always had, like, I felt like I had pick on me written in my fight, in, on my forehead when I, when I was younger. I was, you know, it was like interesting. I, it just, I don't know how it happened. It was always, I switched schools and then initially in the first couple of weeks they try to pick on me and then I get in a fight and then no one picks on me again. I come into high school and they, 
tried to pick on me, and then I get in a fight, and then no one picks on me again, and so on and so forth. But I was always allured at kind of getting into a fight, and someone was kind of able to arouse me and get me to try to defend myself or whatever have you. And, and I just think that the devil is alluring us into fights that we're not supposed to be fighting. He, he's bringing us into battles that were never yours to fight, and we're walking into these things thinking with genuine hearts that we're doing something uh, uh, courageous or something that is actually legitimate, and God is saying, stop. Just stop right where you are. You are not supposed to fight that, but I know that person hurt you. I know they hurt you. You can try till you're blue in the face to let that offense go, but until it's a supernatural appropriation of God, you being able to forget it is supernatural. And so when the thought comes, you think you didn't forgive. And I would just tell you this, feel the feelings and allow him to heal them. Faith is not this blasé dishonesty. Oh, it didn't happen, it didn't happen. I, I, I for, how are you, brother? Blessed and highly flavored, favored, brother, brother. I mean, no, you're not, bro, you're blessed and highly favored, but you're really discouraged. Let's just be honest. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm good, and I'm the head and not the tail. And I'm like, you hate your sister. You haven't forgiven her. And I have had to forgive people for some of the most egregious mistakes to me, to, towards my family, that you can possibly imagine on this side of earth. And I'm telling you, until I finally just say, God, I can't. It's killing me. And he said, because it's God, wait. You can't carry that, Gabriel. You can't carry that. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Now come to me, for I'm gentle of spirit. This is, this is, this is what the text says. If it's heavy, you're carrying something that God didn't ask you to carry. That job, and you're all stressed out about it. Listen, you ain't that good, bro. Your ingenuity is not going to produce the results. That's spiritual. If it's that heavy, let it go. Do your best. Work like everything depends on you. But pray like everything depends on God because it does. Because it does. It is more spiritual than you could ever imagine. And it looks like you're giving it to God more than we could ever imagine. Does that make sense? Say yes. Some of the pains and wounds are so deep that if you keep trying to heal yourself and think better thoughts and trying to let it go in and of your own strength and on your own power, we're never going to be able to do that. We're never going to be able to do that. We have to allow God to come and fight that battle, to come and give us supernatural power. And I can remember I was sitting in my Bible college dorm and I was reading through Romans chapter six and I got the chapter, or verse six rather, and he says, no, you are, you've been, and he starts talking about, you've been buried in the waters of baptism, raised to new life, for you no longer are a slave to sin. And, and, and Paul's telling us this in Romans, I'll just read it real quickly. I'm sitting in my Bible college dorm room, and I'm still trying to get over anger. And uh, it wasn't, uh, in my culture, we call it machismo. Uh, maybe you would call it trying to be a tough guy, notch on your belt. But I actually would feel really convicted if I ever gone to a fight or just kind of lo lost my temper. I was like, that's not me. That's not who I want to be. I don't want to be essentially a grown man that acts like a kid. Some of you grown men, fathers, husbands, you're acting like a kid. That's a temp temper tantrum. And God wants to heal you from that tonight. And so I'm sitting there and I'm like, and I'm reading it and he says this, we know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. Sorry, verse five starts with baptism. Since we have been united with him in his death, we also be raised to life as he was. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. And since we died with Christ, we now also live with him. We are sure of this because Christ raised, was raised from the dead and, 
and he will never die again. Death no longer has any power over him. We are no longer slaves to sin. The definition of a savior means he has to free you from the very thing that enslaved you, which was sin. And I remember sitting in my Bible college dorm room and I said these words out loud. And I looked up at the ceiling and I can remember it had this ugly popcorn ceiling because it was old school. And I looked up at the ceiling and I said these words out loud. And I said, I'm not angry. I'm full of peace. I am full of self-control. For these are the fruits of the spirit. They're not Gabriel's fruits. Gabriel can't produce self-control in peace. The spirit can, but they're his fruit. I said, I'm no longer angry. And I started to, I just tears started coming out of my eye. And I literally, this is almost a little over 10 years ago, and I'm sitting there in the, that Bible college dorm room, and I like said, I said, I'm not angry. And for the first time, spiritual warfare began to look like an appropriation of what Calvary already accomplished for me. For the first time, spiritual warfare began to place my faith in a work that was already accomplished. And it wasn't me trying to, to, to implore tactics and they're helpful, count to 10, breathe deeply. And I can tell you with real confidence, I have not been in another fight. I have not come to that place where anger begins to take over you and you're seeing red. My kids have never seen me raise their voice to their mother they've never seen me speak to her in an ill way they've never seen me disrespect her because I don't because I'm not angry I'm full of peace and self-control do you believe that say yes spiritual warfare in the kingdom looks different and I just want us to come out of this place and not be punch drunk and not be uh, just stuck in this place of God. I, I can't even feel like I can fight anymore and, and so we're exhausted and I just want to tell you stand firm just stand where you are when you've done all that you can and all that you can do just stand say just stand just stand if I could have the band come up just stand just stand God's got hands God's got hands when you some of you need to hear this I know they're talking bad about you could you just keep your mouth shut because again not everything is spiritual warfare but it may not be coincidence the defamation of your character. Listen, when you open your mouth, many times God closes his. But if we keep our mouth shut, our defender goes before us. He is in our future and in our present. Do you believe God's got hands? He is the one who fights this battle. He is the one who accomplishes this battle. He is your defender. Sometimes you just got to believe that your character is going to preserve you and all you've got to do is sit back and watch God go before you and defend you. I know they may say things about you at your workplace or your family and there's tensions and I would just say this, can you let God defend you? We're, we want to be right, but sometimes we can be so right that we're wrong. Paul says these interesting words in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. We usually quote verse 9. I'm going to read verse 8 and 9. It says, three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. Each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. We live in a culture that is overtly trying to be strong. We curate our social media pages to look like the image we want, strength. But we live in a kingdom that says when you're weak, you're actually strong. That interesting? I just wonder, could it be that fighting in the kingdom looks completely different than we think about it in America, in the West? in the world three times I begged the Lord have you ever begged him God please take away this weakness and he says each time he said my grace is all you need my power works best in weakness so now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me that's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, the hardships, the persecutions and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. For when I am weak, then I am strong. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You can be 
fully healed. You can be fully healed. You can be fully set free from generational curses. You can be fully set free from anxiety and depression. You can be fully reconciled to your family relationships and those who have hurt you. I believe that the power of God is that poet. God's got hands. Do you believe that? Say yes. Some of us are fighting our past when God is saying, let it go. He doesn't even fight your past. He just sets you free from it. He just sets you free from it. He's not trying to unravel and, and figure out the rubric's cube of how the, all the mistakes happen. He's like, it's gone. As far as the east is from the west, it's gone. We're fighting things that isn't even on the mind or heart of God. God knows all things, but he chooses not to know your past. It would, it would behoove us if we stopped remembering it. Amen? Amen? I, th I think one of the greatest pictures of spiritual warfare is in John chapter 8. It's the woman caught in adultery. It's the woman caught in adultery. She's caught in the very act. When you're ever in a spiritual battle, do you ever, you're like, man, I deserve to be here. It's my fault. She was caught in the very act and then put publicly to shame in the public square. I think we, we sanitize this story. I don't think they gave her the opportunity to become clothed. They shamed her. Completely exposed, condemned and shamed. At best, maybe a robe over, but she was not clothed. And they're about to stone her to death. And Jesus gets down sits down next to her and I think he begins to have a daddy daughter moment and I think he sits and looks at a daughter exposed shamed in a battle and she's about to be killed there's two places God writes with his finger in the Bible one when he's writing the Ten Commandments and, and the laws on Sinai with Moses. In seconds in this text, he gets down in the sand and begins to write. And, 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 I, and I know that there's a bunch of debate. We don't know what he wrote. Here's Gabriel's eisegesis, my application or meaning placed on the text. I think he was writing what it looked like for a law of love. What it looked like for it to be warfare on behalf of those who couldn't do it for themselves and he was writing a new law with his finger and warfare looked like she is beat she has no right to stand on he gets on the ground with her with his daughter his baby girl that he formed in her mother's womb that has intrinsic value who was precious who still was innocent who hadn't been contaminated and hurt by those taking advantage of her baby you can't beat this battle these guys got you pinned they have full right to kill you that's okay baby daddy's got hands Nobody gonna touch you. Daddy's got hands. Hey, jokers, which one of you without sin? Oh, none of you. Put your stones down or else. Hey, baby. Hey. Where are your accusers? They're all gone, Jesus. They're all gone, Father. Daddy, they're gone. That's right. I don't accuse you either. Now go and sin no more. That's spiritual warfare. God's got hands. God's got hands. We stand to your feet. God's got hands. God's got hands. Do you believe that? Say yes. God's got hands. 
God's got hands. There are situations right now that you're carrying and you feel heavy. And I just, I want us to enter. This is a corporate response. The altars are open. Sometimes it's so helpful with our bodies to respond with what our spirits are saying. Get out of your seats. Come up here. We're going to begin to worship. And we're going to fight our battles the way the Bible teaches us to. The way the Bible teaches you. God's got hands. You know that situation. You have it already on your mind. The Spirit is quickening it to you. And you have got to let that go and let it be with God. The one who has hands. The God of warfare. This is the Lord's battle. This is the Lord's battle.